Hey, man. How's I'm going to do the opposite energy. What's well, up, everybody? I'm not, you know, like a yin and yang thing. Hey, this is exciting. 40th episode. Whoa. <laughs> it's really disconcerting to have you bring that kind of energy because I've never seen you bring it anywhere. So it's really <laughs> off putting. I mean, it's really. I am fucking thrilled to be here. It's this is so well, exciting. I, I don't have I don't have any plumbers coming. I got zero plumbers on the way right now. It's pretty exciting. Pretty exciting. By the way, big 40th episode, the secret dirty truth about how plumbers fucking suck. That's uh that's our secret today. The guy just like texted me yesterday, like as I was about to go live, like, hey, can I come by? <laughs> no. What are you, some college buddy? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> just like... I know there is a weird thing. And and I'm sure, you know, I don't want to blame the individuals. I'm sure every individual plumber is fine. But there is a weird, I've noticed that too, that like, it's like the only thing still operating in kind of like the 1980s is like plumbers and like people that got to like deliver a stove or something like that. <laughs> Like, and, and I'm not blaming them I because they probably work, you know, nowadays there's not, there's very few like individual plumbers. It's like they work for a, a, a group or a company or something, but it always seems like they're like, yeah, I'm just, you know, I might come by like Tuesday. What'd you do in Tuesday? You know, like you get a call, like it's an old friend. Yeah, exactly. It's like a college buddy going, Hey, I'm in town, man. You want to, you know, I know it's a short, I came here on a short notice business trip and, uh, <laughs> The conference got cut short early, so I don't know. You're around to go grab lunch? Like, oh, shit, yeah. Like, this is like plumbers just like, hey, man, I was just knocking on people's doors seeing if they had a leaky sink. Do you need anything? <laughs> like, Hey, hey, man, I know we haven't seen each other in a few years, but I, I just happened to be in town. I thought I could check out uh, the, the feces that's jammed up in your toilet. Is that <laughs> is that something, you know, we could do? Just, like, hang out and do that? Hey, hey uh, it's weird, but my rental car has an extra garbage disposal in it. Do you want me to install it? I mean, this is, <laughs> would that help? <laughs> oh, but man, I'm sorry to hear about the copyright uh, strike. Yeah. They, they they really are going after everything. The latest thing was uh, someone told me they just demonetized We Are Change, which is a very successful long-term channel. Like they've been around since Occupy uh, covering protests and covering uh, a lot of important things. And uh, yeah, the, uh, assuming this has not been, uh, you know, undone by YouTube in the past two days, uh, they were demonetized. It's, I, and, and they're like, I will, they will take the copyright strike do down by August 2nd if I go to copyright school. Like these are their words. There's there's some like re-education camp that I can go to to learn about their, it, literally, Stop. I have to- Stop. Yeah, yeah. Yes, copyright school. Please tell me you got to wear a uniform. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They give you a little Boy Scout, a little Boy Scout outfit and you yeah. get like a little badge. Yeah. You get, <laughs> figure out copyright. And then we got to sell copyright cookies um, <laughs> to raise money to get uh, copyright strikes taken down. So we're going to go door to door selling copyright cookies, uh, explaining to people how copyright law works and selling them cookies. And if we sell enough, then they'll take down our copyright strikes and we get to go to Disneyland. So it's oh, really man. fun. Oh, um, Jesus Christ. Um, these no, I, rem I remember better hope I don't get yeah. become a fucking crypto billionaire because I'm going to hire fucking Navy SEALs to just wipe these cocksuckers off the face of the earth. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm sorry. You were going to say something. What was what was what were you going to say? Uh, I got you, you with the with the term crypto billionaire, you erased my brain. So I uh, I'm not <laughs> I, I have no idea what I was about to say. But. <laughs> I'm going to be I'm going to start my own League of Shadows. Um, <laughs> crypto league of, of shadows <laughs> crypto crypto league of shadows uh, uh i i way back before even moment of clarity was a thing uh i had started a youtube channel and i was putting things on it and like within the first few months uh i got a copyright strike because i showed not a copyright strike a community guideline strike for showing quote unquote nudity and I had shown a like Esquire magazine cover 
So it was like a cover of a well-known magazine, and it didn't actually have nudity. The, the girl that it showed was sideways, so you couldn't actually see anything. And it was the cover of like fucking Esquire, and they were like, you had nudity, so you already have one of three strikes for eternity on your channel. And uh, if that happens, then we'll just delete you. Dude, they pulled down my Gates video because it's, it was medical misinformation. And, all, and I was like quoting like salon and the guardian who were being critical right. of gates right. for not releasing the patents for the COVID vaccine. Right. And yeah, that's no. medical misinformation. Yeah. Now we're, we're in a weird fucking world where you can literally, it actually, you know, it's funny cause I'm, I'm going to mention uh, Columbus on this episode. Uh, and we talked about him in episode 12. And one of my points was like, if you're a kid in American schools and you write, you know, Columbus didn't discover America. He showed up when millions of people were here and he <laughs> genocided everybody. Uh, you will fail that test uh, for putting the truth on it. And wow. I feel like we're now in the adult world of that where like you, you speak the truth on your channel and your channel will be deleted. But if you speak like utterly fake news, like the Russian bounty story or the latest one was this one they've all retracted, all outlets are retracted, that Giuliani was briefed by the FBI on how Russia was going to get him. Uh, if you repeat bullshit like that, then you're a fucking, you're the top of the mainstream media. God, what a dumb world we live in. What a dumb, dumb world. If we, if ever there was a time we needed an alien invasion, it's now. Well, that's why the Pentagon started telling us that there's alien, you, alien crafts or whatever the fuck. They were like, here, you, just take your mind off things with this. <laughs> or are they like, oh man, we know they're coming for us. So we're just going to kind of give people a little bit of a heads up by putting this, <laughs> this info out there because uh, there's nothing we can do about it. That's my thinking. They know we're done. And they're just like, yay, Elon, build that rocket. So we can, <laughs> yeah, so we, can get out so we can put guns on it so we can fight these motherfuckers. <laughs> uh, I think I should pause a moment and uh, do the, the wonderful job we always do of letting people know what's coming up in this episode. Uh, we are going to dig into the, the truth that you're not allowed to know in schools, at least American schools, about Ferdinand Magellan. Uh, really kind of mind-blowing shit about him. And we're going to dig into some of the truth about the death penalty that your government doesn't really want you to know. Um, and we have an update on, uh, a, this is the second week in a row, we have an, like an update came out the day after we taped on a topic that we didn't even realize was coming. This is an update on uh, May Day, which we talked about uh, last week. May 1st is <laughs> is... It became, it was International Workers' Day. Then it became Law Day by Eisenhower. And then this week, it's something new. <laughs> it's Loyalty Day. Biden <laughs> just declared it Loyalty Day. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, loyalty to what? Like a fucking flag, a little piece of fabric that you like the colors of? Or is it the military? You got to show loyalty to your military? Or is it loyalty to, like, a certain, like, fistful of dirt that happens to be between two lines we made up? Look, this dirt. I'm loyal to this dirt. Like, what are you fucking loyal to? So you didn't have a loyalty day barbecue? Is that what you're saying? You, you, you didn't get... Uh, American flag wrap bacon hot dogs and celebrate your loyalty. Um, that's weird. Wow. I mean, I, I did, but then I'm just being loyal to delicious. Okay. <laughs> My loyalty is too delicious, even though I don't eat meat, but loyal to, uh, to I'm faking raped, faking, did I say raped? Faking yeah. wrapped, uh, <laughs> uh, faking sausage fake. <laughs> um, uh, Loyalty Day is such great, um, like, it's like butterscotch pudding for um, the brunch crowd to eat and not realize that Joe Biden is also a fascist, <laughs> right? It's literally like- Rainbow Trump colored a, butterscotch. <laughs> Pudding. It's, it's yes. a rainbow colored butterscotch pudding for them to all eat. And there's a vegan plant-based option version. And they eat that and go, see, Trump was bad. We got rid of him. Now let's celebrate loyalty day. Like 
this sounds like if in the V for Vendetta comic books, it would be like in there. It's like purity through through strength um, is a is a slogan from that dystopian futuristic world that we are now living in. Um, but maybe that's why I keep getting copyright strikes and demonetization is I just, I'm not loyal enough to. Oh, no, you're terribly disloyal. I am terrible. Uh, disloyal. You're, you're the worst, but yeah, no, I think comic book is accurate. I mean, we live in like a comic book reality in general. Yeah, for sure. Um, but so welcome to government secrets episode 40 may day update loyalty day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, yeah. And, and for those who are uh, tuning into this episode missed last week, definitely uh, check out last week for the truth about May Day, uh, the origins of it. And, you know, we got into how important it is. And in most countries, it's International Workers Day. And then the following like day or actually that day, like while we were taping, we just weren't watching Joe Biden. He was declaring it fucking Patriot Day or Loyalty Day or whatever loyalty the fuck. Day. Yeah. Patriot Day is in the fall. <laughs> so uh yeah that's see you, you never know you never wear white after patriot day so you just go loyalty day to patriot day and that's how we know how when the summer begins and ends um, and if you stick an american flag up my ass i can wave it while i'm doing other things so <laughs> that's we all need to be doing that really oh it's fantastic. Um well i have a quick update too i bought another electric car lee i oh, did Jesus. Uh, Leaf update. Now Graham owns a Chevy Bolt. Because it was, I was going to get at, a at least Bolt update sounds more badass than Leaf Bolt update. update. Well, yeah. it's a Chevy, so it's an American car. I was going to buy a Nissan Leaf, but I was like, boy, on loyalty day, I better get you know, an American <laughs> car. So <laughs> I, I, celebrated, I celebrated loyalty day by buying a Chevy Bolt. So I'm excited. This car's got almost a 300 mile range. Apple CarPlay. It's a fantastic automobile. And I Does hope it have enough ra range that you can drive into the ocean when it's time, when it's time to do that? Yeah, I just need just enough to get up speed, <laughs> go off and just go off a ramp into the ocean. So I'm excited. And I, I uh, knock on wood, hopefully this car will last longer. Just, just my luck, my Chevy Bolt would, you know, just run out of battery right as I'm getting up to the ramp to just plummet off that cliff. Oh. Just, I was, you know, right there. I'm like, Goodbye, cruel world. And then I hear boom. <laughs> God damn it. This piece of shit. And then right as it's there, then a then a meter maid walks by and just puts a ticket under the windshield wiper. <laughs> <laughs> just and then I um, have to spend weeks calling the Chevy people, being like, I need a better battery so I can get off this cliff. Oh uh, well, the uh, cliff batteries are back ordered because of COVID, so uh, we can't just uh, do that. So you're just going to have to jump yourself off the cliff. Oh Christ! <laughs> of course I do, but there's a copay and a deductible when you kill yourself off a cliff. Without oh yeah, no, you you, you got to take the car off the cliff. <laughs> listen, I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna go out in style. I'm gonna go out surrounded by cup holders. Okay, surrounded by the new car smell. Uh, I want to go out in class. I'm not, I'm not fucking just walking off a cliff. Well, as we get into our segments now, we've, we've, uh, someone has offered to help and we have fancy slides and stuff like that. <laughs> Which um, Graham looks thrilled about. <laughs> Graham's like, oh, motherfuckers always offering to help. I can't Kate always showing up offering to manage things uh, now i gotta read stuff and i gotta click on more things it's just like <laughs> come on man <laughs> like, it's just <laughs> there's all these emails to read i'm like oh, i just prefer to just i'll, I'll show you what i what i did <laughs> i did literally just put in I love, um i love how put out graham is by someone helping it's just like, and the plumber's going to come here and he's going to do things. And it's just like, ah, oh God, I can't. I got to open the door for you. Jesus. <laughs> what am I, Job? It's <laughs> fucking, ah, oh, this is the worst. What am I, Job? I can't, I really, I'm so. 
I just like things kind of, I guess I've been living alone too long. And I just like, <laughs> it's like, it's like somebody going, Hey, I'll come and organize your apartment. No, you're going to, no. I, I won't know yeah. where it is. Then, then you're going to ask me like, Hey, do you have any more containers? I'm like, I don't know. Ah, God, I can't watch baseball highlights when you're asking me these questions. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm so put out. You said, you said, we were talking to this, you're like, well, I usually spend about an hour prepping for the show and Graham usually does 15 minutes, which was like the most accurate appraisal <laughs> of what I do. And so literally I'm getting on to minute 18, 19, 20, and I'm just like, this is murder. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is like doing taxes. I can't, I just... what do you want me to do? Clean out your rain gutters next? <laughs> this is a disaster. Like. I do this. I, 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 uh, like I think I've said this before, but I like when Graham shows up with wet hair. Like he's just he like the like you can still tell the surfboards in the corner of the room. He's like I had to click record. I had to. Uh. It's like I get out of the water and check my phone, and there's a text from Lee going, "What do you want to talk about today?" And I'm like, "Oh shit! Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I better go home and shower and find something that's literally." That's all I want to do. Lee, the the fate of, of truth and democracy shouldn't rest on the shoulders of like five comedians and a couple of like soccer moms. Like I what, agree. Why is this on our shoulders? Why I, I fucking agree, man. It's like, you ever notice when people put out, because now we've added uh, Katie Halper, who was, a, I don't know if she still does stand up, but she was doing stand up when I knew her years ago in New York. We would do stand up together. So now we've added her to the list. So it's like, it's like whenever people are like, here's the legit media, and they tag everyone, and it's like, it's like you got me, Graham, J uh, Jimmy, uh, Ron Blacone, Katie Halper. I'm like, this is two thirds a list of comedians. This is all Why? Like, what this is like, you know, like Steph Zamorano, and then they're like, and Glenn Greenwald. I'm like, I should not be on the same list with Glenn <laughs> Greenwald and Chris Hedges. I am sorry. I sh I, I don't. It's like, like Max Max uh, Blumenthal, Aaron Mate, and then seven comedians, and then like, and then Chris, and then Chris Hedges, and we're like, this is why? No, no. <laughs> Like Whitney Webb and then me, Whitney Webb, who just comes on my show and has so much information. And I'm just like, uh, yeah, um, I read, I, I, like, this is beyond, I, I feel like, I, you know, like, and all the, and all the cool stuff I've been involved with, like the Assange stuff. And I'm like, oh, Graham, you, yeah. And like Susie Dawson, these mates, these people have put their lives on the line and sacrificed and Hey Graham, do you want to talk to Bill Binney? What? I don't deserve <laughs> to talk to a cryptographer from the N. Like, what am I? What are we gonna? What am I gonna talk to him about? The time I hosted <laughs> game shows. What the fuck? I, are I, I feel the same way. I, you know, for a long time, I, I largely didn't ask like the people I respected most to like be on my my because I have I have redacted tonight, but I have an interview show redacted VIP as well, and I like wouldn't ask them to be on because I was like, you shouldn't want to talk to me. You really shouldn't. I mean. And, you know, like like John Perkins, Confessions of an Economic Hitman is coming on the show. And I'm like, but why? Why? I don't I know. we. I know we asked you to come on and I know you said yes, but I don't get why this is happening. <laughs> it's like I remember meeting Dr. Jill Stein and she's like, wow, you're a truth telling hero. I go, you were locked up for just wanting to be in a debate. Like, what am I? What? what uh, I mean, you're better than me. You're better than like you're a better <laughs> person than I am. Like I don't. Like, <laughs> Graham's like, I thought I was doing everything right when I was hosting a strip poker reality show, and it's like, <laughs> I, <laughs> it's like, why? How did I end up here? What happened? Why is this like? Oh, great! And then, oh man, it's. Oh. All right. Well, let's get into our first <laughs> segment of government <laughs> secrets. <laughs> I got into being a comic because I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to have a real job. No, like, I know. I know. Right. Like I, I told my mom, I'm going to, in high school, I said, I'm going to have a job where I don't have to wear a suit. And I said, and I've never like these, 
nice shirts with stripes on them and little pockets that I got at Ross. Like, this is the most dressed up I want to get. Like, this is me taking the show seriously as I stopped wearing superhero t-shirts and was like, Graham, it's time to... <laughs> like, <laughs> now, listen, now it's time, okay? Buddy, now, now it's time. I bought the t-shirt that has the tie painted on it, so I think it doesn't, doesn't get more legit than that. <laughs> it has a little pocket on the shoulder. So it's really, this is you like dressing up to be an adult. Like I still feel like I'm wearing like my older brother's hand-me-down suit on picture day. That's just a little ill-fitting. Like that's how I, I feel. I slowly gave in to wearing, not to anyone in particular, just to my own ideas. But uh, when I started redacted, I, I was always, I like I always wore vests and like, button shirts on like for stand up and stuff. I never wore blazers anywhere. I felt uncomfortable in them. But then we were like a year in redacted and I put on blazer for like one show. And all of a sudden everybody was like, this is like the daily show, but it's speaking the truth. And it was all of a sudden everyone was comparing it to the daily show basically because I put on a blazer. <laughs> and I was like, all right, if you guys really need a blazer, if that's like something that's really important to you, then I remember one of the last times I was on TYT, the last month we were doing a, you know, Jimmy had said he wasn't going to do it anymore, but he hadn't announced it. So they were like rotating in people to do aggressive progressives and Ron and I would do it and Malcolm Fleischer and, and a couple other people. And I was there and they're like, oh, we really want you to wear a blazer. And I said, is that why people are tuning in is because of the blazers? And <laughs> I said it in front of like some head people at TYT and they all kind of looked at me and I was like, yeah, I'm a comic. I think this is bullshit. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, even though I was never at on internal meetings or anything, but I remember I was on with Jen. I, whenever I'd come out to LA, I'd go on Young Turks. And so I was on, on with him once for something. And, and I had that, mo like, I didn't disagree with the, what the Young Turks were doing, but I found a lot of it to be fluff. And so we're in the middle of like this fluff story. And I was like, what the fuck are we talking about? I didn't say fuck, but what the hell are we talking about? The world's on fire. Like literally the all of the wildlife is dying and we're, you know, the mainstream media is talking about what? What are we talking about? And, and Jake was like, ha, I know. And then he goes back to the story. <laughs> like, like, I know. Yeah. If I can bring it back to the story. And then they ended up using, rather than being, I thought that might make them like think like, yeah, you know, we are covering a bit too much fluff. This is, these are kind of meaningless stories. Rather than doing that, they use that clip of me yelling that in like promos going forward. <laughs> what? Oh God. I just, I don't, there's no, really it's down to us. There's literally seven comedians and uh, some like soccer moms forced into activism and the were the ones that were that it got to save the world um yeah so uh and and uh reveal uh, the the true government secrets <laughs> the true government secrets so um we had a big meeting about not doing this on air but who wants to go first <laughs> Well, we have a slideshow. So oh, the, the slideshow is set up to tell Graham what to do go first. And by the way, uh, I think I can share my screen. So we'll try that later. Oh, okay. So I don't know that we've ever talked about um, uh, the death penalty on this show. But um, one of the things that the this country likes to do is kill people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... and um, so now there's new DNA information emerges in the Lendell, Liddell Lee case four years after he was executed. So if we go to the next slide, um, uh, this was in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette or something. That sounds like, like a bunch of fake newspapers, but we're going to take it as a legit source. Um, <laughs> It yeah, like the idea that there would be an Arkansas Democrat. I mean, the closest they get is Bill Clinton. So I know it's like the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Like, come on, man. You just <laughs> I think it's the Arkansas Democrat Gazette Times Herald. I don't think so. <laughs> what it is. <laughs> Doesn't it sound like a fake newspaper? A little bit, a little bit. Like in a comic book. All right. 
So in this comic book newspaper, it said four years after the execution of an, of an inmate convicted of murdering his Jacksonville neighbor in 1993, new DNA evidence has emerged revealing genetic material and fingerprints from an unknown male, according to a report released Friday from the Innocence Project and the ACLU. Lendell Lee maintained his innocence until he was executed April 20th, 2017, for the murder of Deborah Reese. Lee was convicted in 1995. Nice of them to uh, get around to testing this four years later. You don't want to test it before the guy could potentially, an innocent person could get murdered. You know what I mean? That's just something like there's a backlog. I get it. You know what I mean? Science labs are backed up. Um, well, yeah, I'm sure the guys in the labs are like, look, I okay, he's going to be executed soon. That's not going to make me do this any faster. We have that scheduled for four years from now. <laughs> yes, and I doubt, and we're going to find out here in a second, it's not like a judge could have ordered this test to happen before the execution date, and it's weird. This The South kind of moved slowly and didn't care that an innocent black man was killed. Like, that's weird. Yeah, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't on their priority list. No, no, they don't have a history of those that for 200 years. So um, the next slide, uh, DNA testing of evidence from the crime scene, including the murder weapon and a bloody shirt, revealed the profile of an unknown male. New fingerprints found on crime scene evidence could also not be identified, according to the Innocence Project and the ACLU. The DNA and fingerprint profiles have been entered into a national database, but so far no matches have been identified. So that but to really me- really not him. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer, but feels like that's a pretty bold case for some uh, reasonable doubt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, slightly. Just just a touch. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, uh, this is from KATV News Gazette Herald Times um, <laughs> online. Um, Lee was the first of four inmates executed in April 2017 before its supply of lethal injection drug, the lethal injection drug expired, which they're like, oh, hey, these are going to go bad. We might as well use them. Is that what the hell they did in Arkansas? Like, well, well, but it gets even crazier than that. Multiple. So the drugs they were using nationwide, not just Arkansas, were using for lethal injection, stopped being made by the pharmaceutical companies in other countries be, or, or stopped being shipped to the United States because they realized they were using them to kill people. So other countries were like, we're not going to fucking help you kill people. So they cut off the supply. And then the so so lots of states couldn't execute people because they didn't have this specific kind of chemical. One of them, I can't remember which, maybe Oklahoma, like tried a new cocktail and it was fucking awful. It was like the guy said his skin was on fire for like a half an hour before he finally died. Uh, and then Donald Trump and his administration decided to start secretly amassing these chemicals so that they could kill a lot of people. And they told the companies that were producing them that they weren't using it for the death bed. Like they didn't tell them what they were using it for. So it was like a secretive, let's get a big warehouse full of killer chemicals like program. America is totally normal. <laughs> um, it's not an insane asylum. It's not a death cult. It's not full of like bloodthirsty psychos. It's just really, it's apple pie and um, lethal injection warehouses. So it's really. But like, you know what makes it all better is uh, this koala bear. We now, <laughs> we now have an image of a koala bear and that should make it better. <laughs> we have an image of a koala bear. Um, so koala bears do make it better. Um, and this is uh, Rebecca Cavanaugh is a criminal defense and civil rights attorney and legal analyst. Um, so these are some tweets that she put out. If you go to the next slide, um, the forensic testing could have been done before Mr. Lee was executed, but it was not requested by his appellate attorneys until the ACLU and the Innocence Project get involved a month before his execution. At that time, a federal judge ruled that Lee had uh, simply delayed too long and the testing was not done. Instead, Arkansas put him to death. Even after Mr. Lee's execution, Arkansas refused to release the evidence for testing until a court ordered it to do so. So... I wonder why the black community doesn't trust the system. I just can't quite put a finger on it. 
Uh, yeah. And for those who, uh, you know, here's some more facts on the death penalty that are kind of important right now. Uh, the number one cause, you know, because some people are probably like, what? White people are executed too. But the number one cause of uh, death penalty, of those who get executed, uh, the number one determinant, sorry, the number one determinant, if you look at equal trials, you know, very similar trials, similar circumstances, the number one determinant is race of the victim. Mm -hmm. Because basically, if you kill a black person in our society, that's not that big a deal. But you kill a white person and that we our society views as a real fucking harm to the system. Like you have really stepped over the bounds. Um, and so obviously there's a lot of, uh, of black people executed as well. And another stat is that the Innocence Project has and others have come up with the, the, the average that 4%, over 4% of those executed are innocent. Uh, I think it's probably higher than that. They just can't prove that. But beyond just those 4%, you then have to add the percentage who are severely mentally ill. So then you get into, you know, 20 or 30%. And then you add the percentage where it's like a true instance of self-defense, like a, a, a fucking right. spouse who's being having the shit kicked out of her and then pulls a gun out to defend herself. Uh, and many times, especially if the race of the victim is correct, uh, then those people can be executed. So if you get into like wrongful executions, you get all the way up to, you know, 50% in, in, if you add all these percentages up. Um, and it's just, it's a disgusting practice. Most countries don't even have it anymore. Uh, it's, I mean, it's just so repulsive. Honestly, it goes back to such a barbarian time where we were fucking half animal, you know, half fucking monkey and we thought the answer was to kill these people. Uh, and it, it, it's just disgusting that the United States ever does it. Yeah, it's really, it's like barbaric. It's like, uh, is this like medieval time? I mean, like uh, it's that we're still doing this and not, and now that we have DNA evidence, like we have this science at our, at our disposal now. And, and it's like, that should be exercised to the fullest. And, and like the, you know, it's just, it's can it's more just American lip service of like, it's better to put 10 guilty men free than kill one innocent man. Like we don't give a shit, especially if you're black, if you're a person of color. And not only that, I mean, this is, I mean, this ties into a couple episodes ago where you were talking about the history of, of violent cops and all the statistics we've brought up. They've killed a, roughly a thousand people a year for the last 15 years. And there's only been like seven convictions or whatever that number was. I forget you brought up. Three for murder. Yeah. Three. That's right. Three out of 15,000. That's fair. And um, and then, I mean, but this just extends across America. So you talk about like, um, I, I've done stories on this on my show, Political Vigilante, about murdered and missing indigenous women. There's this inordinate number yeah. of indigenous women that just disappear or get murdered. And there's these awful loopholes where- um, if it happens on a reservation, if a non-native is suspected of a crime committed on a reservation, the reserva the, in the tribal police can't investigate it and they have to get the FBI. In a lot of cases, there's like in, in like the Dakotas or something where there's a lot of Native American reservations, there's like one FBI agent for like the whole state or something crazy like that. So there's this, even the cases where there's like, they have a suspect there's this backlog and they don't even investigate it. That's not even counting the thousands of just women who disappear and nobody knows who they are. And it's like, if one suburban white girl goes missing, everything gets shut down. I mean, like yeah. it's yeah. like uh, yeah. everything. I mean, and so uh, it, it's like, it, it just extends. It, it's so it's not just the death penalty. It's the murdered and dis murdered and murdered and missing indigenous women. It's police brutality. It's just across the board. I used to, the media doesn't seem to do this as much now, but like 10 years ago, it was just like common practice for them to find a missing white girl and just 24 seven coverage. Yes. And it was always a missing little white kid, either boy or girl. And it was never a black kid, never a black girl uh, or, or indigenous or anything other than white. 
the idea of a white little child going missing was like horrifying to our mainstream media. And it was like 24 seven fucking drum beat, all of America flipping out. Where is Elizabeth smart? Oh my God. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I want Elizabeth smart to be kidnapped, but it was like, that was all, it was never anything other than a white kid. And, you know, I used to have a joke about apparently black kids, you know, never fall for the shit from the guy in the unmarked van. When he offers them a lollipop, they're like, fuck you, motherfucker. Whereas right. the other the white kids are like, sure, lollipop, I'll get in the van. Yeah. Um, well, but, but, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it, there's an incredible racial aspect. And, and by the way, I just want to mention, there's a pretty good movie, uh, like Hollywood picture about, about this, uh, you know, murdered, a uh, murdered indigenous woman. Uh, it stars, I don't remember the name of the movie. It stars, uh, wind, wind river, uh, Jeremy uh, Renner. Yeah. Yeah. Blackhawk or arrow man or whatever his name is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Avenger dude. Hawkeye. Yeah. Hawkeye. Hawkeye. Yeah. 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 It's worth, uh, it's with the Jeremy Renner and, um, one of the Olsen, girls i forget uh ashley olsen or something like that but it was directed by jim sheridan i think it's called wind river and it was the first i learned about this this uh it came out about four years ago maybe um and i i was not aware that this was an issue until that mainstream hollywood movie came out uh and then so so it's it's pretty brutal uh and again you know I don't begrudge somebody like Elizabeth Smart's parents for, you know, banging the drum to get the news out. But you, you say it's just it's just so inordinate, you know, like I, I did a story like a year or so ago in uh, January of 2020 before I was up in Portland before the shutdown. Um, and this girl went missing in Utah and the police and it was on CNN and the FBI was involved and all this stuff. And I think they maybe found the girl or whatever. But it was such an example of like, I don't begrudge that girl's family, but it's so out of whack because look, an, uh, uh, an indigenous woman's family, uh, a, a black person's family, they're, they're just as flipped out and just as panicked and want just as much done for their yeah. child, but the system doesn't care, Yeah, you know, and yeah. it's really unfortunate. And I don't begrudge any, any family who gets this kind of coverage, but we have a broken system with our media and our law enforcement that are just like, oh, Right. That, 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 that's absolutely another factor of it that that we haven't or in, uh, mentioned uh, is that a lot of times that black families come to the cops and say, you know, a kid's missing and the cops either don't care at all or care a far lesser degree than John Benet Ramsey's missing. Right. Uh, and and uh, uh, another example, uh, both not white and gay. uh so the cops really didn't care was uh, one of uh, Jeffrey Dahmer's victims uh, escaped and ran to the police station. Oh. And I, I think he was either, you know, maybe naked or near naked and said he was being attacked by this guy. And uh, they, and, you know, they, they, it was clear what either he said it, or it was just clear by his by the fact that he was nearly naked, that, that, this was two gay guys, you know, I'm being attacked by this guy. And uh, he didn't, and I think he spoke bro broken English as well. And the cops were just like, oh, whatever, fucking, you know, gay guys doing their gay thing. And yeah. this, you know, also the guy's not white. And so they just ignore it. And he ends up getting recaptured by Dahmer and of course killed. And it's like cops often don't care unless this is a, a white family. Yeah. If, if, uh, a, a straight white kid would have said, I'm being attacked by this dude, they might've listened, but they just like, Oh, this is some gay, they, gay, gay fight or whatever. And he's yeah. foreign and who cares? And that's just like, you see that example time and time and time again, which is, uh, and again, it, when, when people say, Oh, there's no systemic racism. It's like, no, no, no. This, this case shows you <laughs> if we go back to this, um, the, uh, let's go back to these slides. So Lauren Hill uh, is, is, has written about criminal justice and has talked about this. Um, goes into even other cases. Uh, there's Domin uh, Dominique Ray. Before Alabama executed him in February 2019, two jurors told me they wouldn't have voted for death had they known about his traumatic childhood. They never got to consider this into trial because his lawyers never told them about it. And so it's not just 
the as this as this information has shown the the judge's refusal to bring in the dna evidence uh of liddell lee but in this there's just all this stuff they don't want brought in they just don't want um talking. yeah they they don't bring any of these cases any of this information in there and then on top of that you have uh we i know we did we did at least one episode on i can't remember maybe tooth bite analysis or something uh but so much forensics is just largely garbage. I mean, tooth bite analysis is garbage. Uh, lie detectors are basically garbage. They're largely just used to tell, to, to ba basically make someone scared enough to admit they did it, uh, which does not mean it's an actual lie detector. It's just a scare technique. Um, uh, uh, handwriting analysis, another garbage, quote unquote, science. Uh, ar uh, arson science, which uh, I, I have another point on that in a second. Uh, many of these are just like, there's so few people studying them. Blood splatters, another one. There's so few people studying them and so much of it is not really scientific. It's like theory, like, oh, if the guy pulls the knife this way, then the blood goes that way and shit mm -hmm. like that, that it, uh, it's largely just used to pin the blame on the people that the cops want to pin the blame on. So percentage wise, who were they more likely to pin the blame on blame on? Oh, the black guy that happened to be walking in the neighborhood. Uh, so it, though, though a lot of the forensic science is just used to go after whichever person they wanted to go after anyway. And, you know, it could be a white guy. It could be that they were suspicious of the husband and, and uh, or whatever. And so they just said, oh, the blood splatter so shows you did it. Uh, so it's not just uh, black people or indigenous people, but it's it's more often used against, you know, in a racial way. You know, it's, it, it is used in a racial way. But but as this Lauren Gill um, puts up there and if you go to the the next slide, um, she the, the, she talks about Missouri executed Russell Bucklow in October last year after years of challenges to lethal injection. In 2018, the doctor who diagnosed Bucklow with antisocial personality disorder, which his attorneys say swayed the jury to vote for death, admitted he was wrong. <laughs> so it's like they're, they're, she's what, what Lauren Gill is pointing out is all the ways that. Um, so not only is it is it stacked uh, by race. But then they're just they're executing people for for just faulty evidence, um, and then they didn't introduce that this guy was was abused as a child. Not that oh they that what you know it doesn't. And some people always say, well he what he gets the right to just to kill people. No, that's not what they're saying. But lethal injection is not a, they've proven it's not even a deterrent. It's not like yeah it, at all. It, it, yeah, it, if you, like if someone wants to ever wants to debate me on the death penalty, it's like every. The argument for why the death penalty exists is bullshit. There is not a, I've never heard a single argument for why the death penalty should be used. It's studies show it's not a deterrent, which makes sense because usually if you're getting ready to kill someone, you either think you're going to get away from way with it, or you're out of your mind, angry and not thinking about, Oh, maybe fucking 20 years from now I'll be yeah. executed. So it's not a deterrent. It doesn't actually save the state money, which would be a ridiculous reason to kill people anyway. But People think it saves money of imprisoning people, uh, you know, compared to imprisoning people. But uh, it doesn't because the number of like uh, uh, legal appeals and court mandated lawyers, uh, it usually does not save the state money. Um, and then people usually come down to like closure. But first of all, there's an equal number of families who are like, we don't want this guy executed. It's not going to make us feel better. We'd rather him sit in prison. Some say, oh, it's an easy way out. We'd rather him sit in prison. Uh, and think about what he did. But so there's many families that don't want execution. But and and then, they, you know, people will say like, oh, it, it feels good, you know, an eye for an eye. But an eye for an eye is not the fucking law of this land. It's not even an eye for an eye is not the law of the land, even for someone who steals an eye. Like if you knock someone's eye out, they don't sentence you to have your eye knocked out. Uh, so an eye for an eye doesn't exist. I mean, it might feel good. It might feel good to see a rapist raped, but we don't sentence them to that. Uh, it might feel good to see a, a, a dude that killed someone, you know, because he set a fire, like set on, like his house burned down. But we don't, that's not how the fucking legal system works. The only way, the only place out of our entire legal system 
where we do a quote unquote eye for an eye is executing people where we get it wrong all the time. Yeah. That's such a great point. You don't like, oh, you were determined at fault for this car accident. So now someone's going to ram into your car. Like, yeah, someone's <laughs> going to, someone's got to run into your car. Someone's just going to smash your car. Um, but, and, and more, uh, more evidence from Lauren Gill, if you go to the next slide is in March, Alabama executed Nathaniel Woods for shooting three police officers, though it was widely acknowledged that he wasn't the trigger man. According to the shooter, all Woods did that day was get beat up and he ran. So, yeah, An another good example of that um, is uh, a guy named Kenneth Foster, who luckily activists basically saved his life. Uh, he was going to be executed in Texas, year, uh, you know, a decade ago or something. And he was not that even the prosecution said he hadn't killed anyone. He was in a car. His friend got out, got in a fight, killed someone. And he drove away once his friend got in, got back in the car. And so Texas has a quote unquote law of parties where if you're with someone who kills someone, you can be executed. So they were going to execute the driver, despite the fact he had nothing to do with it. Uh, and it, it's just, it's, it's, it's fucking horrific. I mean, luckily, basically the governor at the time, uh, Rick Perry got so worried that the publicity on it was going to like hurt his presidential runs that he commuted to the guy's sentence. But that's incredibly rare. Most of the times, Texas will just kill these people. And uh, in terms of, to go back to arson science, uh, another one that was likely innocent that they executed was Cameron Todd Willingham, also in Texas. Uh, this guy was, uh, he was in a mobile home with his three daughters and the mobile home catches fire and he tries to save, tries to save them, but it gets too hot and he runs outside and calls the fire department and the RV or whatever the trailer burns down, killing all three. And they executed him for setting the fire and killing his daughters. Now it's almost certain. Yes, there's always a possibility, but it's almost certain that he didn't set that fire. Uh, our, an arson ex quote unquote expert at the time said, Oh yeah, we know he set the fire because uh, we found uh, uh, whatever they're called, you know, flame uh, lighter fluid, uh, by the doorway, remnants of lighter fluid uh, by the doorway to the thing. But what they didn't present in the trial is that's where they kept their barbecue grill and their lighter fluid. Uh, so likely it just all burned in the fire, exploding the lighter fluid at the front door. Um, and, and like the, these quote unquote arson scientists, uh, it's, it's just bullshit. It basically, they go with what they think the cops want them to do. Oh, the cops have pinned it on this guy. So yeah, it was this guy. We can tell that the, the RV, you know, or the trailer uh, lit on fire by a human being like, but it, 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 other arsonists, not arsonists, other arson, quote unquote, scientists or experts have said that's absolutely not true. So, you know, add that to the list of innocent people executed. Yeah. I mean, the, the, <laughs> And also too, the whole, again, part of the problems and how we police is this way it's sort of set up in most police departments that detectives, you know, got to clear cases, which means get yeah. a conviction, put it to bed, you know, and, and hit your quota and get out and get on with it. Like open cases are no good if you're a cop, yeah. if you're a detective and it's not good for the district attorney and the mayor and it's, it becomes a political thing. Uh, cause everyone wants to make tough on crime or whatever. It's like, if yep. you want to make detective, you got to clear case, like all this, it's all stacked up in favor to just like, who kind of looks like they might be guilty, pin it on this guy, get enough evidence to suggest it. Uh, and, and guilty, we get a guilty verdict. We did. Yay. You won high five. The district attorney gets another notch in, in his or her belt and they can run for office or whatever else. That's what that's. And and as with uh, with Malcolm X, the killers of Malcolm X, and likely uh, with Mumia Abu Jamal, the cops in the killing of Malcolm X, they were just like, well, let's just round up the 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 black guys we don't like, you know, a couple of black guys we don't like from the neighborhood that have you know different religious views from Malcolm X, meaning they were with the Nation of Islam. Malcolm X had broken from the Nation of Islam. So they were like, okay, here's two Nation of Islam guys we don't like and in the neighborhood. We wanted to pin something on them. 
So two of them, one of them was involved, but he always he always said we we've covered this on the show before. He always said the other two were completely innocent, and uh, but two of them were just the cops were like, yeah, we don't like these two people, uh, these two black guys. And with Mumia Abu Jamal, it was likely similar that uh, you know he he was framed for the killing of a cop. Uh, the cop did get killed by somebody, but chances are the Philadelphia police didn't know who, didn't have a suspect. And they were like, well, grab the guy who is a well-known, you know, radio show host who's speaking against the government, who's speaking for black power. And uh, we'll just grab that guy and say it was him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I think we should, uh, you know, uh, so as we don't drag this episode out too long, I think we should jump to the next topic, maybe. Oh, shit. You're right. Wow. Next segment of Government Secrets, Lee Cap talking about the truth of Freddie Magellan. <laughs> Freddie. <laughs> uh, well, uh, also in my, uh, you know, re really, I just want to uh, continue to, uh, 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 you know, bring bring up your spirits. I'm, I'm you know, we're. Talk, I feel like talking about uh, black people being executed. We we did a little bit. And uh, now yeah, uh, gutting yeah. American history. Is, uh, it always it always brings a smile to your face, Graham. Just learning how awful America can truly be. Yeah, just the, the broken system of innocent people getting executed. And now more lies that were told to all of us in, uh, in grade school. So I think I have to set this up as to why we're talking about Magellan on government secrets. Uh, and I think the real thing is like, you're like, this starts at like a very young age. You're told to like worship in a certain sense, these, this group of largely white people, you know, you're, these are the presidents. You got George Washington and Lincoln and, and, oh, here are the great explorers who founded the nation. And, and, you know, you got Columbus who, uh, by the way, I looked up episode 12. Everybody should go back. If they want to learn about the truth about Columbus, go back to episode 12. Uh, you know, Columbus is this hero and he's, he's white too. And, uh, we're just told all these all these incredible people. Oh, they all happen to be white. You know, there's it's rare that a history teacher is like, uh, "Hey guys, notice that these awesome people are white." It's more just, uh, "Hey, we happen to keep showing you heroes. They happen to all be white," which ties into the last story of, and oh, by the way, we just happen to keep showing you bad guys in movies and TV shows, and oh, they just happen to always be black. So culturally. Everyone can just sort of accept, accept that, oh, this guy wasn't really innocent that we, you know, committed to the death penalty. It's like, uh, and and doesn't want to believe, oh, he's just finding some loophole in the law. That's how we got out because for several hundreds, for hundreds of years around the world, but in this country too, but in all throughout Western Europe, um, we've been told, oh, the white, the white people, specifically white guys were great and they've done everything awesome in, in history. And, you know, black people are less than, you know, people of color, native, yeah. native indigenous people, whatever they're, they're just less than. And this is, this isn't, this is, I mean, I would, I would, I, 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 I submit, and, and I'm sure you do too, that your story about, and what we're going to get into it is tied into the first story. It, that this helps yeah. create a narrative where jurors or judges or the legal system in general just go, mm, yeah, he's probably guilty. The black guy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it absolutely does. And, uh, and I, you know, I didn't think about it. This could be another episode of government secrets would be like, like ho Hollywood, you know, race in Hollywood. And I didn't really think about it as a kid. Of course you don't, but you grow up, you know, worshiping various uh, cartoons or, you know, whether it be Peter Pan or whatever else. And it never really occurred to me that like, wow, every cartoon, every movie that's meant for kids, there's like no black heroes uh, for like black kids to put themselves in the role, to imagine themselves being. Like mm -hmm. if you are going to imagine yourself being Superman as a kid or one of the other or Batman or anything. it's just all white. And I get that. I get that uh, Marvel, you know, tried to remedy that by, you know, in the late nineties, introducing probably more black characters. And so there are some now, and I think there's been a black Spider-Man and stuff like that, but it, it took a long time to even begin to remedy that. 
Uh, so it's like, you just, all of our heroes, everything you see as a kid, it's just all white, 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 white. Well, growing up as a, as a kid that collected comics in the seventies and the eighties, there were two black superheroes, Power Man and Black Panther. And I've that's never heard of Power Man. Power Man. Um, he had a comic book, Power Man and Iron Fist. They actually, Marvel made it into a series on Netflix. Um, that was really a, a good series, but it was, he was the only... And I, I collected Power Man and Iron Fist. And uh, and those are the only two that I can think of that are like mainstream comic book titles. Uh, and a quick side note, Stan Lee made in the Marvel Universe, Black Panther and Wakanda, the most powerful people in the whole Marvel Universe, just as a F you to racists. <laughs> nah, nice, nice. Which is why... Yeah. When that movie came out and was so successful and they released it in a February, which normally February is considered the dead zone for Hollywood releases, but it just is old, dumb thinking from Hollywood. Right. Uh, it was the number, it was like number one in the box office for like six weeks. Um, when it, when Black Panther came out and whatever that was, 2014, 2015, somewhere in there. Anyway, little nerd side note. <laughs> little, little nerd side note to your side note. Uh, I remember, and this will relate back to Black Panther, but I remember when I was a kid, because I knew my mom's weaknesses, uh, I saw that there were two black action figures for sale. I, don't, I must have seen a commercial or something. And uh, I knew that I that if I said to my mom, like, you know, they, they say there's, you know, there's almost no black action figures. Or like, like they say, these, uh, you know, it's very rare or whatever. And, and so my mom bought the action figures for me. Um, but they were still, and I didn't think about this as a kid, but I think about this now. They were, yes, they were black action figures, but they were black like Egyptian pharaohs. And so still, even as it's saying, hey, you know, it's okay to be black, it's still like, but the, but still you should be looking up to the oligarchy. Like it's still the oligarchy. This happens to be a black oligarchy, but still the rich and the powerful are the rich and the powerful for a reason. So uh, let's, let's, let's appreciate that. Uh, so there, and there's some of that in black Panther too. It's still the, still the oligarchy. Yeah. still the aristocracy of Wakanda. Right. 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 All right. That was side note upon side note upon side note. But so to get on to uh, Magellan, uh, he, is, is held up as the guy that fucking first circumnavigated the world. That is the big thing. Oh my God, this awesome white guy, awesome white explorer, circumnavigated the world, fucking incredible. Back then, 1519 or whatever, it's fucking it, 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 huge, incredible. And honestly, until like a fucking year ago, I didn't know that he never circumnavigated the globe. <laughs> like, <laughs> at all, at all. The dude never did it, all right? Just some rich dick that drove his, his rode a boat around a lake and went. Let's just call it the world and put it on, <laughs> put it in writing. And we'll, we'll, who's going to argue with me? So his goal was to get to the Spice Islands, which are you know basically Indonesia, uh, because spices were incredibly like you could you could retire on a bag of cloves. That's like not a joke. That's literal. If you got a bag of cloves back to Spain, you could fucking require re retire. It was like the Bitcoin of the day uh and so he goes on he sets off on to get to the east indies to get to modern day indonesia in 1519 and he did lead his crew across the atlantic uh and through the strait of southern america well hold on i actually don't want to get to yet to what the rest of that quote says but during that time there's a mutiny he has five boats with him and a large crew of over 200 during that time there's a mutiny against him and and he was br brutal i mean you know maybe most people facing a mutiny would have been. He takes the head mutineer, uh, slits, gets a, you know, sneaks up on him, slits his throat, chops his body up, and leaves the pieces on spikes in the cove. Uh, I think around Argentina, somewhere around Argentina today, uh, on spikes sitting there, and the body parts were still visible like sixty years later in the cove when Francis Drake arrived. Uh, so, you know, Magellan was not a guy to fuck with, let's say. So he then gets to, uh, uh, South America. He gets, uh, over the, uh, through the Strait of South America, uh, and across the Pacific. 
which is pretty incredible at the time. You know, we're talking like a year or whatever it took them or, or a year, over a year. Uh, but he was killed only halfway through the circuit in a skirmish with natives in the Philippine island of Mactan. Now, that, that quote doesn't really do it justice. It's not a skirmish with natives. He gets there. He has a translator, a slave named Enrique, who is able to translate with, there's multiple tribes in that area. And he basically befriends one of the tribe, the, the head, you know, chief of one of the tribes. But he still, ba he, he, he becomes overcome. He no longer seems to want to get to the Spice Islands. He becomes overcome with being like a lord of these people. Because he has guns, he has cannons, they can't do anything to me. I'm I'm the big white fucking conqueror. And so he says to the chieftain he's befriended, is there anybody you're warring with? Because I will vanqu vanquish your enemies. Uh, I have our guns and our men, it doesn't matter how how many there are, we'll kill them for you. Just tell us which tribe you're you're warring with. So that chief says, Oh yeah, I'm warring with this other tribe over here. Uh, and and Magellan goes, okay, great. Just give us a minute. We're going to go fucking brutalize, destroy, murder this whole other tribe for no other reason than we want to convert people to Christianity and we uh, want to show how powerful we, are, powerful we are. And also, I think he probably thought it would make a good story once he got back to, to Spain and Portugal. He'd be like, dude, I fucking wiped out a tribe with... You know, there were a thousand of them and 200 of us. Took me 10 minutes. Uh, so he goes over to this tribe and they, you know, they begin wiping people out. But he gets like hit with an arrow and he's like injured. And then the chief of that tribe comes over and, you know, accounts vary, but basically just fucking murders him in like hand to hand combat. Murders Magellan. Murders Magellan in or, or sword to sword combat. Um, yeah, just fucking executes him. And so it didn't go as planned. <laughs> <laughs> so his, I'm going to wipe out people in the name of Jesus, uh, is actually going to get me killed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, but, and, and for no reason, it wasn't like they got to that straight, and, uh, you know, there was a straight and they had to get through and the tribe said, absolutely not. And he said, well, I have to battle these people because it's the only way for us to survive and get through. It wasn't that. It was like him being like, hey, I like murdering people that aren't white. Uh, do you have any? And the tri that, that tribe was like, yeah, we got some over there we hate. <laughs> oh, and I love that they did it in the name of Jesus. Like, you remember that segment in the Bible where Jesus is like, just go murder some non-whites because you want to uh, and do it in my name. You remember that? What was that? Was it Leviticus or which one? <laughs> which one was that? Yeah, it was all in the name of Jesus. I mean, Jesus was a brutal motherfucker. Yeah. Uh, Jesus was like a hippie socialist who was like, you guys did what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you guys exactly. did what in my name? What? <laughs> exactly. So Magellan's m death meant that he personally failed to circle the world. You don't say. But his expedition continued on without him. There was a fight between the boats and one, basically one of them actually, uh, one of his ships actually arrives back in Spain in 1522 having completed a successful circumnavigation of the globe of the missions, 260 original crewmen, only 18 had survived the perilous three year journey, 18 out of 260. And by the way, the investors, and this, this shows how, you know, capitalism or at the very least profit over all else matter, you know, is matters. The investors viewed this as a success because they had the bags of cloves. <laughs> like, <laughs> 18 out of 260 come back and they're like, well done. <laughs> wow. I don't care that 242 people are dead as long as those cloves made it. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. Boy, you got to love, you know, even the early early versions of capitalism were just fantastic. Like, yeah. They, they, they really were. You uh, name a societal ill. Name anyone. And we could both trace it back to, to it's being caused mainly by capitalism. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Without name one, name, 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 anyone, name, name one, like anyone like pollution. That's capitalism. Everyone was living off the land and in harmony before we had to just make products to do like name one, the war, the environment, 
crime, domestic violence, name what ra- ra- racism. You wouldn't have you wouldn't have anything near the level of racism that we have in this society if there wasn't immense inequality. Like you end up with racism when people fear for their security, and that can be financial security, it can be security for their family, uh, it, it can be security in multiple ways. But if you have equality and people don't feel for their fear for their security, they don't think, hey, tomorrow. I could not know how to pay for healthcare, then their anger and their disgust and their frustration and their fury is not able to be channeled towards let's get the black people. Oh yeah, dude. But it, it all traces back to shit like this four or 500 years ago, because look, look at, look at 500. I mean, look, they went around the globe, got murdered people, tortured the in natives. As long as they got their clothes, they didn't get like all of it. Gen- stealing of the native American land was for money. Slavery was for money. Like, uh, all of it. All, I mean, Columbus came here for money. Um, butchering natives. I mean, all of it was just like, so we could have money trade routes. I mean, this has been happening for centuries of just murdering people for money and creating racism. Well, we look, they have, a, they have resources that we need while well, we're a little more, we have more uh, weapons where we've, because we're so greedy and, and awful, we've created more efficient ways to murder so we can wipe these people out and take their land and their resources and their trade routes. Like capitalism is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd say so. Um, and and you know you you like. Well, anyway, I I wish I should keep going because anyway, I, I I'm, I'll get off on a tangent for a half hour. But uh, so then comes up the question: Well, if Magellan, the the thing we've been told in our history classes, you know, our whole lives, if Magellan was not the guy that fucking circled the globe, then who the hell was it? Who should we be? looking up to as like, wow, that's the first guy to do it. Uh, and I'm sorry, they were all men. So it needed, it is a guy. But uh, so one theory is uh, Juan Sebastian Elcano, who uh, took over the trip. Uh, the most obvious candidate is Juan Sebastian Elcano, a Basque Mariner who took control of the expedition after uh, Magellan's death in 1521 and captained its lone surviving vessel, the Victoria, on its journey back to Spain. Elcano and his, sa- and his sailors stand as the first people to have successfully voyaged around the world as part of a single journey. But they may not be the first humans to have circumnavigated the globe over the course of a lifetime. So, yes, they were the first to do it as a, like, sing- a single trip as a goal. Uh, and, you know, that's incredible because it's like, wow, we've been lied to our whole lives. And furthermore, Elcano actually, for the initial years after this trip, Elcano was viewed as Magellan is today. Elcano was the guy that those areas, Portugal, Spain, and, and maybe around there, viewed as like, wow, this guy fucking did it. He got around the globe. It wasn't Magellan. Uh, however, a Magellan kind of supporter and maybe sycophant or whatever ended up writing the history that, and I think he wrote it in English as well, that ended up getting to like the, the rest of the world, uh, getting to especially the English world in Britain. And he wrote the history as if Magellan was the hero. So that's where you have history shift from talking about Elcano to talking about Magellan. However, it doesn't end there. Because actually, Elcano may not have been the first person to cross. Uh, Many historians give the honor to Magellan's Malay slave, Enrique. Magellan had, he was the translator I mentioned before. Magellan had seized Enrique from Malacca during an earlier 1511 voyage to the East Indies. And the Malay later served as the expedition's interpreter in the Pacific Islands. Enrique had previously traveled west with Magellan from Asia to Europe before joining in the voyage across the Atlantic and Pacific. So by the time the mission reached Southeast Southeast Asia, he had very nearly circled the globe and returned to his homeland, albeit over the course of several years and multiple voyages. So what what this quote's not saying is uh, Enrique... After Magellan dies, Enrique says, well, I had a deal that I was free upon Magellan's death. 
And the ship that was going to continue on said, no, 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 you're still our translator. You're still the slave. You, we still own you. And he said, no, no, no. The fucking deal was Magellan dies. I'm free. And so he said, fuck y'all. <laughs> and he went on his way and he was in the, the Philippines not that far from his, you know, birth town or whatever is, you know, where he was actually from uh, in Malaysia. And so he likely continued home, at which time he became the first person to circumnavigate the globe. <laughs> of course. Of course, it was like a person of color that actually did it. And then they just said, oh, no, the white guy did it. Of course, that's what happened. It was a slave that they lied to. Um, wow. So that, yeah, so that is- we are told, oh, it's Magellan. Oh, and hey, you know, this is the guy. You look up to this guy, great expert, you know, expeditioner, great, great uh, voyager. What an incredible dude. Meanwhile, the actual guy that was traveled around the entire earth at a time when it took years to travel around the earth, you know, eating rat stew and fucking, you know, drinking boot leather. Uh, it was Enrique, a slave who actually did it. So the Magellan like navigation app should change it to Enrique, the slave. Yep. They should change it to Enrique. Yep. Oh, what a fantastic government secret, man. Oh, by, and by the way, Enrique might've been his, uh, you know, his name that they gave him when they captured him because they didn't want to say, his real name, which this statue, people might not be able to read it, but this statue says uh, it's of Panglima Awang, a.k.a. Enrique. So I'm guessing his real name was Pengli- Panglima Awang, and uh, that's who we should learn about in our history books. <laughs> we should learn about Panglima Awang. We absolutely should learn about that. I don't care about Mangela's bullshit and his failed exposition, <laughs> ex- expedition, and he gets burnt. <laughs> like, I don't care about that idiot. Like... <laughs> He's just some dumb, rich, white guy that couldn't get it done. (laughs) Oh, wow. That's the map of the whole journey. Look at that. There's the journey. Wow. I mean, it is. I I was trying to picture it in my head. Like, it was when they. So so first of all, you have to imagine. They get through the the Strait of Magellan, it's now called. It should be called the Strait of Panglima Agwang. The Strait of Magellan, they get through there, which was incredibly difficult. And already they've had like multiple mutinies. It's been like a catastrophe. It's taking longer than they expected. Oh, they're out of supplies as well because the uh, they were shortchanged on the supply when the boat were uh, the boats were filled with supplies. And then they get across there and they think that they're right next to the Spice Islands, like Malaysia and Philippines. So they venture out into what we now call the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> thinking. Oh, any day now, we're going to see the Spice Islands, and this is all going to be great, and we're going to be filled with riches. And instead, it is 17 weeks of eating, like, rats and boot leather. Like, and just octopus <laughs> omelets or whatever they're having. Yeah, just just misery. Wow. Uh, this is a fantastic government secret. Just really historical... Good. So kids, thank you for watching. Magellan's a lie. Another thing you were told, Magellan's yep. a complete lie. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, Lee Camp, that is uh that is a fantastic government secret. <laughs> Magellan was a liar. Pang Wong? But Peng, what is it? Pagi oh shit. Paglima Awong. Huh? Paglima Awong, ladies and gentlemen, your new Magellan. <laughs> um, well, that was a fantastic episode, despite my uh, not wanting to do it at the beginning. It was really, uh, it was <laughs> we did it, man. I think, I think we cheered you up and uh, I, the plumber never showed up in the middle of this. <laughs> yep. It's great. So whenever he shows up now, it's okay. Um, <laughs> well, all right, buddy. Um and I, it's good to know too that you can also share these slides now that we're. <laughs> I thought, honestly, at that moment, I thought you were jumping in the ball to go off the cliff. That was that was the moment. I was really close. 
when it was like, and I was somehow clicked on something to make the slide smaller. Like, I don't know how <laughs> and, that happened. And to bring, the, to bring the government secrets logo over top of them all. How did that happen? I'm literally, I'm the Magellan of slides. Like, I'm not good at it. I, I, I should not be in charge of this. Uh, but you were the Pagliwa Ong Wong of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the Google Doc. Thanks, thanks, man. That, that means a lot. That means a lot. <laughs> Well, Lee Kemp, where else can people watch you do uh, the fantastic work that you do? Well, first of all, I highly uh, recommend that anybody who's new to this podcast, uh, yes. first of all, give us a five-star rating. That actually matters on all the iTunes and everything. Uh, also, uh, go back and listen to past episodes because, as you might have noticed, almost everything we do is evergreen. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, uh, they're not going to start teaching the truth about Magellan tomorrow in our schools, I don't think. So... Uh, most of it's evergreen. So go back. If you want to hear the one on Christopher Columbus, that's episode number 12. You can hear about how, how his awesome killing. And, uh, and uh, yeah, all my stuff's at uh, LeeCamp.com. New Redacted Tonight comes out tonight. That's uh, We'll put it up at LeeCamp.com. And uh, my Twitter is at LeeCamp. Yeah, and if, you have, if yourself or any family or friends are like, man, they shouldn't be tearing down those Columbus statues, just listen to episode 12. There you go. That ought to... And just listen to us reading out of Columbus's own journal hit in his own words of how evil he was and why he should never have a statue anywhere. Um, like Columbus university needs to change the name, uh, of everything where I live in the districts district of Columbia. Yeah. That should be <laughs> DP, the district of Pagawa Angwong is what that should be called, baby. Oh, there was a, well, I don't know if it was actual bill, but there's some, some Congress people were uh, saying it should be changed to the, the Douglas, the Douglas something. I don't know what the C stands for, but uh, anyway, after Frederick Douglas. So they were going to keep the initials DC, but they were going to make it stand for something else. Ah, uh, I see. I see. Um, well, folks, uh, yeah, please go back and, uh, and, and whether you're watching or listening to government secrets, like it, share it, f positive reviews, tell people about it. We're only 40 episodes in. Um, we haven't even been doing it for a year, which is pretty, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to do, uh, except when I'm given more than 14 minutes of work and, um, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, is it is it maybe you could get like a waterproof phone you could work on reading things while you're on the surfboard actually yeah that's <laughs> what surfing's all about getting work done on a multitasking <laughs> that's why you go surfing it's like people that are like bringing an ipad on a hike um <laughs> dude i was on a hike I, we were in the middle of fucking shenandoah national park it's gorgeous the trees are in bloom. There's just no, no, nothing but, but waterfalls and fucking animals and shit. And coming up the trail, we start to hear like, you know, fucking Creed or something like Nickelback. And then we pass two people and the guy's got his phone out playing, playing like Nickelback as he walks by us. <laughs> I was on a hike yesterday and somebody was playing music and I'm like, yeah, why would you want to listen to the birds and the wind and be completely submerged in nature when you can have some of your dumb Spotify list on your stupid, uh, whatever Amazon speaker that you've got zip locked on your dumb hiking bag, you moron. <laughs> like anyway, so don't bring music on a hike. That's stupid. Anyway, um, <laughs> moral, of the, moral of this episode, moral of this episode, Magellan didn't do shit and don't bring music on a hike. Um, Magellan so, didn't have his fucking Spotify. They was playing on his ship. No, he didn't. And if he did, maybe that's why they killed him. Was like, who wants music <laughs> on this boat? Um, we want to eat boot leather, shoe leather, whatever. <laughs> yeah. In peace. In peace. Uh, Folks, check out my show, Political Vigilante. Uh, we stream four or five days a week. We got, uh, and then of course, uh, go to rockfin.com. Lee and I both have a lot of content on there. It's a great way to support what we're doing. I am way more dependent upon Rockfin now that YouTube has been, has demonetized me. We're in our third month coming up on, yeah, we've done three months of being demonetized. It's fantastic. Um, so uh, go to grandmelwood.com. There's merchandise. There's all this great way to support me. And I have a new tour date. Uh, I will be uh, my first headline show in over a year at the Blue Note in Waikiki, 
two shows Sunday, Woo! May 30th. So, uh, Wait, all what, what's the date? Uh, Sunday, May 30th. It is Memorial Day weekend. So, come nice, on out man. to Oahu, Lee. And, um, do you feel like you're going to be rusty? Oh, God. Yeah. I did a set just of like a 15 minute set, um, Wednesday night. And I was like, oh, geez. I was, uh, I was like, and it was plexiglass and, you know, they, Check your, check your temperature and all the comics had been vaccinated and everything. So, but I, man, I did this bit I haven't done and I did it like in the wrong order and forgot. Right, something. Right. I was like, wow. Right. So I'm going to be getting on stage like one, at least once or twice a week for the next month to make sure I got my shit together for May 30th. Right. But yeah, go to grandma.com. If you live in Hawaii or want to come out and visit, uh, come check that show out. And Ron Placona and I are going to be starting to announce tour dates in September and October, probably in the next month or so. We're starting to get holds from comedy clubs and stuff. So check all that out at grabelwood.com. Thanks, man. All right, buddy. Have a great day. We'll see you next week. Later. Bye. Thanks for watching, everybody. Please hit the like button, the subscribe button. Go to patreon.com slash Graham Elwood and rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood where you can support the show. Also, I have a Bitcoin wallet, a Bitcoin cash wallet, and an Ethereum wallet in the show notes. We're taking cryptocurrency. I have a Coinbase affiliation link. We're going to be getting on some other exchanges. So that's how you support the show. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. YouTube is unsubscribing us at an alarming rate. I have a PayPal button at GrahamElwood.com. I even have a Venmo at Graham-Elwood. There's a lot of ways to support our show. We are getting crushed by YouTube. They're We've dipped under 73,000 subscribers because of YouTube. Thanks for supporting what we do.